Good morning everyone. Our topic for discussion is about the school sites. A school site is one of the factors that can either enhance or hinder the implementation of its instructional and non-instructional programs. The site is one of the factors that can determine how useful a school plan can be to the members of the local community. Site planning is the unseen foundation of any land development project. We understand the importance of creating exciting properly designed space based on understanding the client's need and concerns and the nature of the site and surrounding land uses. The site development plan specifies the present characteristics of a particular parcel of land and its surroundings and describes intended activities and their potential impact on the community. The terms site plan and site development plan are interchangeable. The latter is generally used since it is defined as the intent of the plan and the review process more accurately. School Site Development A graphical presentation of the site development program is referred to as the site development plan. The main function is to show the school site in its present status and the current program period. There are principles of site development. First, all physical facilities with similar functions are grouped together. It is in accordance with the most favorable options for grounds utilization which creates functional zones and sets the basic patterns for physical development. Physical facilities refers to the school plan that is the school buildings, classrooms, libraries, laboratories, toilet facilities, offices, and other materials and infrastructures. The site is subdivided allocating well-defined portions for specific purposes. Another principle of site development is the layout of buildings and other structures. It is critical in preparing the site development plan. Next, school buildings shall be oriented in accordance with the sand path or east-west course of the sun during the day. To prevent the direct entry of sunlight in the instructional spaces, Buildings shall be laid out along the east-west axis so that the window have a north-south exposure. Another principle of site development is that buildings shall be arranged to facilitate cross-ventilation by exposing the window sides to the direction of the prevailing breezes, which is generally northeast-southeast. The east-west orientation is sufficient in as much as it allows adequate cross ventilation. Also, when site limitations such as the unfavorable areas or shape of the site prevent the proper solar orientation of buildings, economical alternatives shall be resorted to. Example, trees near the buildings are effective for minimizing the direct entry of the sunlight into instructional spaces the distances between buildings shall be such that ventilation is not obstructed natural illumination is not impeded and sound does not carry into nearby buildings minimum distance between buildings laid outside is eight meters the recommended setback of the school from the street line is 5 meters to sufficiently reduce intrusive noise. Next is the school site development planning. The purpose of school site development planning is to anticipate the future needs and development of a school in terms of physical facilities and to contribute towards conducive teaching learning environment. A school site development plan shows the following improvements. Improvements of school buildings, including the position of existing and proposed buildings. These proposed building plans are important because they help to visualize what the end results will be like so that you can evaluate ahead of time and make revisions if needed. Proposed structures are shown in broken lines and existing structures in solid lines. Existing structures include any structure that is currently designed to support the attachment of facilities. 
A school site development plan should also show improvements on arrangement of circulation elements. This consists of the main road, the sidewalk, the driveway, which are intended to facilitate movement within the school site. Utilization of open areas Open spaces affect the character of development and vice versa. Open space also stabilizes other land uses, reduces noise, and conserves natural resources. Site development must be flexible enough to allow modification according to the needs of the times. It should allow removing the inconsistencies in the validation of its structures of plan when it is being reused in a new planning situation. However, modifications shall adhere to the basic pattern of development. Now, let us proceed to preparation of a school site development plan. The plan shall be drawn on a tracing paper measuring 500 mm by 750 mm. Any white sheet of paper may contemporarily be used. It shall be drawn to scale as follows. 1 is to 500 for sites of 2 hectares or less and 1 is to 1000 for sites of more than 2 hectares. The following technical descriptions shall be indicated on the plan. Technical descriptions is a tool that provides users information about the features of property. These are the bearings of the property line, distances between corners, and boundaries of the lot. The plan shall show the direction of the north. The top side of a map is often the north direction. Relative position of existing features in the site such as creeks, large trees, and others which shall be allowed to remain. The plan shall show the relative positions and descriptions of existing buildings and structures. Relative position of existing circulation elements and hazardous areas. Open spaces will serve as a temporary evacuation sites. In most areas, covered courts are used as emergency evacuation areas. Use contour lines if possible. These are the lines on the plan that represent those points that have the same height or have the same altitude. Contour lines shows elevation and the landscape shape. They are useful because they illustrate the shape of the land surface. Existing structures such as buildings, walls, playground, and others shall be clearly shown in the solid lines and the proposed structures drawn in broken lines. At the bottom of the plan is the title block bearing the following information. 1. Name of the school and its complete address. 2. The name of official who prepared the plan. 3. Names and signatures of the recommending and approving officials. And 4. Date of preparation. The plan shall be prepared in 2 to 3 copies. One copy to be retained in the school. Another copy to be filed in the district in case of elementary school and last copy to be filed in the division office. In the event of change of school administrators, the approved plan on file in the school shall be included in the turnover of school property between the outgoing and the incoming school administrators. No changes in or deviation from the plan as originally approved shall be made without the approval of the school's division superintendent. Next is school site zoning. School site zoning is apportioning the different areas or zones of which is designed for a specific purpose or utilization in accordance with the educational needs of the school. An important principle in zoning is to create the proper visual, physical and functional zones as follows a visual zone it is the area which best projects the aesthetic appearance of the school under visual zones we have loans usually located in front area of the school loans shall be landscaped and drained they shall be planted with low growing border plants and ornamental shrubs to give maximum visual effect Fruit-bearing trees are discouraged to be planted inside or front of the school building as they may cause destructions and accidents to the school populace. Another area are the flower gardens. 
the intervening space between the main buildings and the home economic building on one side and shop building on the other side may be developed into flower gardens. A decorative mini fence of wood or bamboo may be put up around the flower gardens for protection as well as for better visual effect. Flower gardens shall not be merely decorative. They shall be utilized in connection with lessons in science, home economics, and other school subjects. Next are the flower beds. The space around the buildings may be made into flower beds for further visual effect. It may be bordered by a very low decorative mini picket of wood or bamboo. Only low growing ornamental plants shall be planted in the flower beds. Another is assembly area. Adequate space immediately in front of the main building shall be allocated as assembly area for entire school population. It is where the whole school population assembles for flag ceremonies, school convocations, or programs and others. The ground shall be leveled, drained and tamped hard or cemented. Another school site zone is the physical zone. It is by determining the sizes of the different areas or zones according to standard requirements. An example of an area zone by its physical characteristics is defined in terms of characteristics like development density, minimum lot size, and building coverage, placement, and height. And functional zone. Zoning by grouping together areas and buildings with similar or related use or function. An example of functional zoning would be an area that has designated zones based on a function such as an industrial zone, a recreational zone, and residential zone. School site zoning ensures proper rationalization of the relationship and utilization of external spaces so that no aspect of the school program may be sacrificed. Our next topic is about external areas in school. External areas in school. The external areas in school are the following. Agriculture area. The tradition laboratory for agriculture, or what is traditionally known as the school garden. In 2007, Gulayansa Paralan program was launched by the Department of Education in partnership with the Department of Agriculture to promote the value of school gardening as contribution to the feeding program and raise awareness to have locally grown vegetables and crops that will benefit the community. The Department of Education, through the Bureau of Learner Support Services, School Health Division strengthened the implementation of the Gulayansa Paralan program in public elementary and secondary schools nationwide to address malnutrition and to promote vegetable production and consumption among school children. This memorandum is issued to sustain school gardens not only to attain 63% sustainable garden at present but also to establish gardens in all schools nationwide. The Gulayansa Paralan was issued and implemented through DepEd Memorandum No. 293, Series of 2007, entitled Gulayansa Paralan, to support the hunger mitigation initiatives of the government and to encourage both public elementary and secondary schools to establish school gardens to ensure continuous supply of vegetables for the school-based feeding program and other feeding programs. The general objective of the Gulayansa Paralan is to promote food security in schools and communities through self-help food production activities and values among the learners and appreciation of, of agriculture as a life support system. Specifically, it aims to promote vegetable production in public elementary and secondary schools, establish and maintain school garden as ready food basket source of vegetables in sustaining feeding, serve as laboratory for learners, produce in the schools vegetables which have rich sources of protein, vitamins and minerals and eventually increase vegetable consumption and improve learners' nutrition, showcase small-scale food production models and inculcate among the learners the values of gardening, good health nutrition, love of labor and caring for others. Playground area the school playground provides a safe outdoors environment within the school that stimulates children to use their creative energy in healthy interactions with one another. The most enchanting schools always have large 
open playgrounds with interesting play equipment that leaves many options for creativity. Playgrounds provide the opportunity for children to practice skills that will ultimately play a role in adult competences such as the ability to collaborate with others, to develop decision-making skills, and successfully take on leadership rules. The playgrounds must be spacious and outdoors, but they must also be secluded so that the children feel safe and do not have to consider the outside world. It should seem open and spacious. Thus, some high walls are necessary, but using school building as boundaries as well can preserve the open feeling of the playground. The importance of a school playground. Playing at a school playground may seem like just an ordinary thing, but there is much more to it. When children are physically active at a school playground, they are building critical development skills. Playgrounds provide them with a perfect opportunity to explore different things and express their creativity without fear of being reprimanded. The skills they develop at the playground will ultimately play a critical role in adult competences, such as working in a team, successfully taking on leadership rules, and making sound decisions in critical moments. Improves attention, decreases stress and anxiety, and prepares students to learn. It also improves motivation, helping kids try things they might not normally be inclined to try. Primes the brain cells to change when new information is introduced. Circulation area The circulation area consists of the main walk, the footpaths, and the driveway which are intended to facilitate movement within the school site. The main walk, which is the primary access from the front gate to the main building, should at least 3 meters wide. The footpaths, which are the secondary access between the different zones and buildings within the school site, may be 1 or 2 meters wide. The standard driveway, which is intended to serve vehicular traffic inside the school site, should at least 3 meters wide. The circulation pattern of a school is an important planning point that must be got right early in the design stage. There should be a clear circulation strategy covering all levels from access to the buildings to local circulation between spaces. Circulation and Social Area Circulation and social areas are generally calculated on the basis of 18% of the total area of teaching and non-teaching space within the internal phase of the external walls of the school. The school main entrance should have strong sense of arrival and space. Internal signage should be clearly visible to all users. Particular regard should be paid to signage for students with special needs. Corridors should be a minimum of 1,800 mm clear in weed floor area is below the recommended floor area requiring the provision a leaf will not normally be required of a leaf set down in the technical guidance document to part m of the building regulations and the same range of accommodation for all building users is available at ground floor level also where a leaf and suitable fire escape refuge are to be provided and funded by the department. The design team shall consult with the planning and building unit regarding specific advice on leaf types, etc. Designers should make use of natural lighting, space, and color in the circulation areas. Floor and wall finishes should be appropriate for the school's needs and location. Durable finishes should be specified. Outproof lobbies should be provided at the main entrance. Stairs should have threads, risers, and balustrading, etc. in accordance with a technical guidance, document to Part K of the building regulations, and appropriate for use by young children. Permanent vents and offening sashes should exceed the current guidelines set out in the technical guidance documents to the building regulations. Roof lights may be considered. Access and circulation. Pathways that allow freedom of circulation around the school are linked to better student outcomes, although this finding is not consistent across all studies. There must be equitable and sufficient access for all students located in appropriate places around the school. Care should be taken to avoid unintentional physical barriers such as curves, twist holes, or heavy doors. Consider corridor width to allow equitable circulation. Accessibility for those with reduced manual dexterity should be considered during the design phase. 
athletic field. Athletic field is a piece of land prepared for playing a game, playing area, playing field, field scene of action, arena, a playing field where sports events takes place. In order to support sporting activities including competitive games and play, school of all types and sizes will need access to outside spaces. Sports fields are the primary active outdoor area for middle and high school students. Planning a multi-purpose athletic field complex at a school has several advantages. Fields can share the lighting and irrigation system. They conserve land use and they allow for concentrated and most cost-effective maintenance. Why schools should have athletic field? Students say that playing sports has helped them to develop a sense of work ethic and has increased their motivation to succeed. One of the benefits of high school sports is that it increases a sense of self-awareness and pride that translate into the classroom. Six factors when planning a school sports facility. Here are six factors when planning your next project. 1. Creating a safe and enjoyable user experience. Providing safe and customized practice and gameplay environments helps motivate athletes and teams for the big event. A well-organized facility that lets spectators move seamlessly from their vehicle or public transport to a clear entry, enjoy the event, and exit the facility quickly allows them to enjoy an exciting and stress-free experience. Providing a multi-purpose community facility. We've previously explored how participating in sports not only helps students athletes develop important life skills, but also positively influence their social and economic futures. Many athletic complexes today simulate real-world experiences that support learning for sports-adjacent careers. Those include marketing, broadcast technology, physical training, physical therapy, culinary and event management. Some districts have been developed programs that pay students to operate the scoreboard including creating commercials and instant replays which provide them with real-world learning opportunities and actual job experience. Number 3. Identifying Budget and Funding Sources Communities vote on bonds proposed by the school district to build or improve facilities. Per state law, once these funds are approved by voters, they cannot be used to pay for operational expenditures such as salaries. Additionally, legislation passed in 2019 gives communities the power to vote on athletic and performing arts facilities independently from the school ban. Then, once the ban is approved, athletic departments have other means of raising funds to help with maintenance, equipment, costs, and travel. 4. Choosing an ideal site Site selection can have a large impact on how the facility functions and the cost of construction. Access is a major consideration when selecting a site that will serve thousands of spectators. Topography conditions can have a large impact on construction costs. There is a presumption that a flat site is the best site. Soil conditions can also drive up the cost. Sites with shallow groundwater conditions can be prohibited a field from being lowered to take advantage of berm seating. 5. Cultivating pride in your facilities. Creating a durable and easily maintainable building is important regardless of use, but it is particularly important in an educational facility. Almost every surface in an athletic facility, a highly active destination for athletes and spectators alike, needs to be durable and easy to clean. Using high-quality, visually appealing materials in frequently utilized spaces such as locker rooms helps foster a sense of pride and personal responsibility in student athletes for all ages. They understand that this special place has been created for them and as a result are motivated to respect and to take care of it. Maintenance areas are another great project component where an intentional design approach can promote a sense of commitment and connection to the facility. 6. Planning for future expandability One of the worst mistakes a designer can make is to design themselves into a box without thinking about possible future expansion. This can include increased seating capacity, which would also impact restrooms, concessions, and parking, as well as future facility amenities.
school beautification. School beautification is a great way to do all those things and more. Bringing schools and communities together, it is a way to create and preserve both beautiful and healthy environments where learning and camaraderie is enhanced. To put it simply, think a student walking in on the first day of school. Objectives for the beautification project in school A well-maintained schools provide a safe and attractive learning environment for students. School beautification projects, however, can offer much more than physical improvements to the school's buildings and grounds. Through cleaning and painting the outside and inside of the school and by planting new flowers and shrubs, the students can take advantage of educational, personal development, and community building opportunities. First is the physical surroundings. The most visible result of the school beautification project are the changes of the physical surroundings, removing graffiti from the walls, picking up litter and garbage, and even planting new trees and flowers will help to create an clean and attractive learning environment. Physical changes inside the school could include adapting the classroom and the common areas by painting murals or encouraging the student to decorate the outside of the lockers. Second is the educational and academic. Beautification projects provide the unique and relevant teaching opportunities. The educational objectives of such projects could be the children learn about the history of the school and surrounding areas, or that they make sign about the plans that they add to the school's ground. They could learn about the biodiversity of the school grounds or the correct way of to apply paint for the murals. Tying the beautification project in the school's academic curriculum enhances the children's learning. Third is the personal development. There are many opportunities for personal development of the student within these projects. The objective is to have the students place leadership rules and take responsibility in the planning and conduct of the beautification project. Participating in the project can instill a sense of pride and ownership for the school and students. Working with peers and being involved in group decision making also provide personal development opportunities. Fourth, it is, is the environmental awareness. Any changes of the school, whether the physical buildings or the grounds, allow the children to develop a heightened awareness of the environmental issues surrounding the school's community. Discussion of how area to can be this way, whether by neglect, pollution, or the respect for property, will illustrate the effect of people in the environment. Developing solutions to improve the area and to keep from regressing can create a sense of responsibility in the student and a desire to preserve the changes. Identifying immediate natural environment and its characteristic as they plant trees, flowers and rugs will connect the student directly to the earth. Fifth is the community involvement. Building community relationships is an important objective which was lost beyond the beautification project. Involve a variety of people in the project, starting with the school's community of teachers, students, and support staff, and moving onwards to parents. Local businesses may donate supplies and the local organizations such as senior homes or the Girls' Guide may offer to help. Developing a community sense of pride and ownership and contributing to the improvement of the local environment will establish the ties in community. What is the purpose of school beautification? Along with encouraging students to be more involved in their school day, beautification teaches students how to be more respectful of the environment and to clean up or after themselves. As the community sees how well treated their nearby school is, a sense of pride will begin to consume the community. How can I beautify the school premises for the educational support of the students? Through cleaning and painting the outside and inside of the school and by planting new flowers and shrubs, the student can take advantage of educational, personal development, and community building opportunities. The most visible results of the school beautification projects are the changes of physical surroundings. How to improve your school's appearance? If you feel like your school is not in the greatest shape, or just not a very enthusiastic place, you can start it as a project improving schools, making physical improvement, increasing educational opportunities, and leading betterment campaign are all methods for turning your school into a place that everyone can be proud of. First, enhancing your school's appearance. 
Beautify your score, increasing your school's curb appeal is one of the fastest and expensive way of improving it. Take a look at your school and see what kind of thematic changes you might be able to make. Picking weeds, pruning hedges, planting flowers, and picking trash up out of a field or parking lot are always quickly at making things look cleaner. Second, start a garden. A school garden that student staff can work on its great way to increase involvement and pride in your school. You don't need soil and the ground to create a garden. Try hydroponic, a method of growing plants without soil. A flower garden, a vegetable garden, climber plants, artificial astroturf, or other plants that look beautiful. Work in a garden can be tied into educational activities. Science classes, for example, can learn about photosynthesis or the life cycle of plants by helping out with the garden. Letter A. Reading Garden Turn a courtyard or other outdoor space into an inviting area to read. Install vinces and walkways, plant flowers, bushes, and flowering trees, include grassy areas and shady trees where children can stretch out with a good book and begin a lifelong habit of reading for pleasure. Letter B. Visible Garden Tie together history, social status, math and science, Ask parents to their children to volunteer the weekend to prepare the plants and crops. Incorporate the garden into classroom lessons centered on planning the layout of the garden, projecting its yield, and predicting the effect of weather pattern on the crops. Plant vegetables and colonies grow, or grow a crop that played an important historical role or is vital to the, the local economy. Number 3. Paint a Mural Making an inspiring painting part of your school is sure to improve it. Your school can start discussion and vote on the design, which could be the school mascot or historical figure, a local landmark, etc. Art classes at your school can even get involved with making the mural. If your school wants to commission an outside artist to paint your mural, make sure that the design, budget, and timeline for completion are worked out. Number four, make school more engaging. If you feel that your school needs improving because of its boring, don't give up hope. Talk to teacher, school administrators, and student about developing ways to make learning fun and more engaging. If the goal is to innovate and improve your school, then everyone will be on board and willing to develop ideas. Number five, go green. If you feel like your school would be improved if everyone tried to be more eco-friendly, there are many opportunities to take action. Gather ideas like choosing eco-friendly school supplies, making sure that recycling bins are available at your school, replacing paper towel dispenser with blown air and high dryer, starting a compost pile, planting trees every semester. Number 6. Fundraise if there is a project at your school that needs financial support, whether it is a painting a mural or purchasing school supplies for needy students, you can help start fundraising campaign. There are lots of ideas such as hosting a silent actions or student work, hosting a game night with an intense fee. Number 7. Ask parents to get involved. Schools are not just places for students to learn. They are also an important cornerstone of any community. Families also talk about school and will want to be involved with any improvements that need to be made. Parents can get together at a parent-teacher organization meeting, school board meeting, booster club event, or other opportunity and consider ways of helping to improve your school. Number 8. Let people contribute in their own way. Many school improvements will need a lot of support. However, it doesn't mean that everyone has to contribute in the same way. When raising support to improve your school, make sure that the people understand there is a room for everyone to help. For example, some might be a great organizing people, while others will have a talent in writing or design. Some will be able to devote time during school hours only, while others will have more time after school hours or on weekends. Some might be able to get involved in the school ground itself, while others might be great at gathering support for your school within the surrounding community by fundraising, for example. Number 9. Ensure that the improvements continue. 
efforts to improve your school will only have their full impact if they can continue in the future. My next topic is about evacuation. Evacuation means existing a facility as directly and safely as possible. A evacuation is an appropriate when condition inside a structure post, a threat to health and a safety of building occupants, and leaving the facility is safer than remaining inside of it. It is also a safe and a provide temporary and emergency shelter for persons displaced from their homes following a short time before the disaster strike. School Evacuation Site it is a location designated by the formal action of the governing body, superintendent, or a principal, or any school at location to which juveniles are to be evacuated to or are to assemble at in the event of any emergency or other incident at a school. Why is the evacuation area important? During an emergency evacuation of any campus building, it is important for the occupants to assemble at a safe distance away from the building. This keeps building occupants clear for the hazard zone and the location where the information can be given to all occupants at one time, those avoiding rumors and miscommunication. The school evacuation plan is a kind of documentation of showing evacuation roads in the building structure. Preparation in the advance can prevent injuries when emergencies or disaster. Schools as temporary evacuation centers. Why are they used? When homes are destroyed or damaged during disaster caused by natural hazards such as storms, floods, earthquakes, landslides, tsunamis, and volcanic eruptions, it is common for the public spaces and buildings to be used for the shelter until people can safely return home. Shelter is a critical requirement for survival and it is necessary to protect security and health. Shelter is also important for human dignity to sustain family and community life and to enable affected population to recover from the impact of disaster. Schools are often deliberately chosen by disaster management authorities to serve as shelters. Schools can offer protection from elements, have water and sanitation facilities, offer classrooms and assembly areas are recognized as child-friendly spaces. Schools are also important institutions and community hubs. They have a high degree of visibility and familiarity for the local communities, particularly elementary schools that are centers of a range of community activities. As a result, communities may also simply go to school for shelter without direction from disaster management authorities. Because of conscious effort to protect children in many communities, schools are designed and constructed to be the most disaster resilient structures available. How are they used? The most common ways that the schools are used as shelters are First, shelter in place for the school population to keep students, educational personnel, and visitors safe from harm during sudden severe weather such as tornadoes and flash floods, and after sudden onset emergencies until students can be safely reunited with their families. Second, Short-term evacuation centers or safe havens for students, families, and community members sheltering in response to threats or hazard, especially from the storms, floods, severe weather, and tsunamis early warnings. Third, collective centers for the communal shelter of internally displaced persons or refugees whose home had been destroyed or are unsafe due to disaster or conflict. Fourth, Occupation by armed forces. What are the impacts when they are used? There is a currently no formal research in Pacific on the impact of the school use as the temporary shelters. There are, however, observations from several specific countries indicating negative impacts such as damage and destruction of the school property, as well as interrupted education. There seems to be a difference between the schools hosting their own students, staff and their extended families, and the school being taken over to host and displaced population. While using existing schools seems an obvious solution for this temporary shelter needs is not carefully planned. It can have a negative consequences for children's physical safety and well-being, for their rise to education and to protect education sector investments. The common assumption that the school or sheltered of the last resort has in practice means that the school are the first choice to be used, and without planning, 
instead of the school are to be used as temporary shelter, we need to plan for this. Principles for the limited use of schools as temporary evacuation centers. First, minimize the use of schools as temporary shelters, create national disaster management policy and consistent schools disaster management that plans for all other shelters options in advance of a disaster. Second, plan for schools as temporary shelter where necessary schools should be built, maintained, equipped, and managed and to meet the shelter population's needs and to safeguard education investments. This includes meeting and minimum requirements to ensure human dignity, safety, child protections, and educational continuity. Third, plan for and enjoy educational continuity. Creating a safe environment for educational continuity includes planning for dual use of learning facility for shelter and education, and the use of temporary learning spaces, transitional learning spaces, and alternative delivery systems. The plan should specifically mitigate the rest of student dropout due to school and accessibility and closure. Fourth, never allow the use of schools for military purposes nor occupation by fighting forces. This is separate for the acceptable rule that trusted military may have in cleaning up school debris as part of their civil and relief operation. The Safe Schools Declaration is an intergovernmental political commitment. The declaration gives countries the opportunity to express support for protecting students, teachers, schools, and universities from attack during times of armed forces conflict. For the importance of continuing education during the armed conflict, the implementing concrete measure to deter the military use of schools.